I don't know exactly what the cumulative effect has been mm -hmm. on me. I, I don't know how many people have told me, and these are very hard things to hear. It's been hundreds of people, because I, I meet people after each of my lectures, you know, who've told me that yeah. they are still alive because they watched my lectures or because they read my book or, and then they usually have a good story to tell, you know, about what sort of hell they happened to be in six months earlier and what they did to pull themselves out and how that's brought their family back together or helped them advance in their career. When the University of Toronto sent you some military letters that I thought were against the spirit of the university, that they weren't supporting you, they were actually threatening you. Yes. And that said to me that something deeper is wrong here, that universities, or this university is, is upside down. Uh, how did you reason that? How did they get there that they could be so completely uh, up, uh, unaware of their own position? When I first got the letter, the first letter, and, and I know how HR yeah. departments work, they send you one letter in the morning so that it's documented, then they send you another so that it's documented, and then they send you a third, and if you haven't ceased by then, well then they go to the next step, which would be something to do with whatever approximation or termination they would they, 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 they document you. Yes, yes, and, and they're documenting all the steps, and I told the person who delivered the letter to me, um, it was a person I actually got along with quite well, that it was full of errors and it was poorly written and that they should take it back and write it properly. You know? <laughs> I did. I, I did. know. I followed. And, and, I know. and because if they're going to do this, they better do it right or there was going to be yeah. trouble. And I didn't mean that I was going to cause trouble necessarily, but that there was going to be trouble. But they didn't take it back. So I read it on YouTube. So, and then I did the same thing with the second letter. The other thing, too, is that they actually did me a favor because. One of the things I claimed in the YouTube video that I made was that what I was doing by making the video was probably illegal. Yes, I remember. And their lawyers basically said that it was probably illegal. So that also helped me to establish my bona fides and say yes. He's an the law. And so it wasn't all bad. are running scared it's very difficult for them to to find paying jobs it's their staffs are shrinking the newspapers are in trouble um, television stations are vanishing uh, and so there's increasing desperation I would say as well as decreasing professionalism among those who still practice and so some of it's the personal failings of the ideologues who happen to be occupying the positions that ideologues occupy but some of it's a consequence of these transformations in, in, in communication technology that are so vast that they're actually inconceivable. And I think YouTube, both YouTube and podcasts are, are, are great examples of that. Podcasts even more than YouTube because YouTube serves billions of people, which is one walloping network. Yeah. But podcasts are maybe 10 times as popular. So. It, and that's all underground. It's interesting because yeah. they don't attract as much attention you know, or as much, as much controversy. Um, maybe because they're more siloed in some sense. Yeah. But the journalists are fighting a losing game. And, and I think as you fight a losing game, I've seen this happen with corporations, you lose your best people first. And then the death spiral begins. And, and I think we're seeing exactly that. And, and then that's exaggerated by this program polarization that also might be part and parcel of the technological changes. Okay.
One of the things that I have watched quite frequently is the way that people respond to being mobbed on Twitter. Yeah. You know, now I've almost stopped looking at Twitter. It's been about three months that I've taken a Twitter hiatus. Saying I still post. I I don't even have my password anymore. I send what I want to post to a third party, and they post. You know, one of the things I've pointed out to my audiences is that there isn't a debate about who should speak on campuses. There's a debate about whether free speech exists. That's a whole different debate. I don't think people don't understand the difference in the severity of those debates. If I don't want to talk, I still might believe that people can talk. Yes. They can exchange opinions and they can change yes. each other's minds, and even if they're different. The argument that's being put forward on the campuses to stop people from speaking is that there is no such thing as free speech. All there is is the exchange of, of the ideas of avatars who are possessed by their own video. Exactly. Exactly. And the logical consequence of that is to refuse to speak and speak because why should you allow the group that you have to speak to to have this voice? So it's, it's the, the collectiveness is the identity politics by this. It's the very idea that you know that you can post this that goes back to the terrible, terrible, the despicable French intellectuals who in my opinion, yeah. were responsible for leading this revolution. I think the fundamental thing that I've learned is that you can speak in in the deepest terms imaginable, if you're careful, to an extraordinarily wide range of people, and that that and that that's desperately needed, and that hopefully it's salutary. It looks like it's salutary, and and so that's hopeful. You know the the. The counterpoint to the stress of, of the last three years has been the my observation of the positive consequences of having these sorts of deep, as deep as I can make them anyways, philosophical discussions, and to watch thousands of people participate as if it's important.